Our scripture reading this morning is Genesis chapter 22, verses 1 through 19. Now it came to pass after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, Here I am. Then he said, Take now your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, and saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him, and Isaac his son, and he split the wood for the burnt offering, and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar off. And Abraham said to his young men, Stay here with the donkey, the lad and I will go yonder and worship, and we will come back to you. So Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and the two of them went together. But Isaac spoke to Abraham his father and said, My father, and he said, Here I am, my son. Then he said, Look, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide for himself the land, lamb for a burnt offering. So the two of them went together. Then they came to the place of which God had told him. And Abraham built an altar there and placed the wood in order. And he bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So he said, Here I am. And he said, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Then Abraham lifted his eyes and looked, and there behind him was a ram caught in a thicket by its horns. So Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up for a burnt offering instead of his son. And Abraham called the name of the place, The Lord will provide, as it is said to this day, In the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Then the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time out of heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore, and your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies. In your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned to his young men, and they rose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. May God add a blessing to the reading of his word. So I think that there are very few people here that enjoy taking tests. I pulled the kids earlier, and none of them seem to enjoy taking tests. And for most people, tests are a source of stress. I usually do well on tests, but I still don't like taking them. But if I were to take a test, my favorite type is a multiple choice test. Because usually I know enough of the answer that I can pick out you know, one correct answer from uh, the others that are listed there. But my least favorite is an essay test. And especially if it's a timed essay and I only have a short period of time to write it. I usually don't do well on essay tests like that. And for an essay test, a short answer test, you can't really fake it if you don't know it. You really have to know the information. But not all tests are written. Some are oral tests, and some are practical tests that test your ability to do something. Uh, for example, with welding, you take a practical exam to prove that you can actually weld. And for first aid, you actually put bandages on people and stab people with needles to prove that you can do it. And the military has physical fitness tests uh, to make sure you're in shape. Equipment is also tested. Uh, this morning, before I went out, Scott here, Ewald turned down the sound system and played music, made sure everything worked. Uh, there's also like the emergency broadcast system, those annoying tests that interrupt your favorite song on the radio. And scientists will test hypotheses, or hypotheses if it's more than one thing that they're testing. 
So tests have different weights and purposes depending on the situation. Practice tests don't count for anything, so people don't usually get stressed out about a practice test. It just gives an idea of where you're at on something. But final exams usually have a lot of weight to them, so that's what people usually get the most stressed out about. Uh, some tests are pass-fail, and others are graded on a scale where you have to get a certain percentage right in order to pass. The purpose of most tests is to ensure readiness, to ensure that you've learned the information so that you can move to the next grade or the next subject, uh, to make sure equipment is ready to use, to make sure soldiers are ready to carry out their tasks. And, but some tests are just to see whether or not something is true. In our passage today, Abraham is tested. Now, the rabbis say that Abraham was tested 10 times, and they disagree on what exactly those 10 tests were. But I'm going to list uh, the general consensus on the 10 trials that Abraham faced. Now, the first was leaving his homeland, then the famine in Canaan that caused him to go to Egypt, Sarah's abduction in Egypt, having a child with Hagar, the war with the four kings, the command of circumcision, Abimelech's abduction of Sarah, driving away Hagar, driving away Ishmael, and then the final test was the one we read today, the binding of Isaac on the altar. Now these trials were not testing intellectual knowledge or physical ability. They were tests of whether or not something was true. What, the question was, was Abraham's faith true? When you see illustrations of this passage, when you see pictures of Isaac, he's often depicted as a young person. Now, the scripture doesn't say exactly how old Isaac was. We know from the previous chapter that he was weaned. He wasn't nursing anymore. And then in the next chapter, we find out that Sarah dies at the age of 127. So that means that Isaac would have been 37 at that point. So he's somewhere between the age of a child that has finished nursing and 37 years old. And uh, the rabbis say that he was actually 37. They blame Sarah's death on this event. Uh, they say, this isn't in scripture, but they say that Satan told Sarah that Abraham had gone through with the slaughtering of Isaac and that's why she died. Uh, but, um, there are some clues as to how old he might be. Uh, verse four says that on the third day, Abraham lifted his eyes and saw the place afar so off. So we know that he was old enough to walk three days, to go on a three day journey walking. Uh, verse six, Abraham gives Isaac the wood to carry up the mountain. So we know that Isaac was old enough to carry a pile of wood up a mountain. And in verse 7, Isaac notices that they have the fire and the wood for the burnt offering, but no lamb. So he was old enough to know that something was missing there. Uh, so I, my guess would be that he was probably in his late teens, you know, a young, healthy man. An interesting note about the location of this test is that Mount Moriah is the location of the Temple Mount. In 2 Chronicles 3.1, it says, Now Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on Mount Moriah. So this is an important location. A lot of important things have happened at this location uh, throughout history. Now this passage is famous. A lot of people know this passage because some amazing things happen in this passage. Uh, first of all, Abraham agrees to sacrifice the son that he and Sarah had waited so long for. To me, that's amazing. I can't imagine sacrificing any of my kids, but especially not a son that I'd waited so long for. Uh, secondly, it's amazing to me that Isaac doesn't put up a fight. Uh, so this shows to me that Isaac had faith also, that Isaac trusted his dad, his dad knew what he was doing, and probably trusted God and figured God knew what he was doing. And then finally, a ram appears in the thicket at the last minute, and Isaac is spared. 
So that's amazing also. Now we know from the we know from the first verse that this was only a test. But Abraham doesn't know that. And I can only imagine the relief that he felt when that ram showed up in the thicket and he didn't have to sacrifice his son. And verse 12 tells us the reason for this test. The angel of the Lord says, Do not lay your hand on the lad or do anything to him. For now I know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. Now fear here is talking about reverence. That Abraham loved God, respected God, had reverence for God. And he proved it with his actions. And Abraham is blessed for passing this test. Uh, the angel of the Lord says in verses 16 through 18, By myself I have sworn, says the Lord, because you have done this thing, and have not withheld your son, your only son. Blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your descendants shall possess the gate of their enemies, and your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed, because you have obeyed my voice. Now we have all faced various trials in our lives, but why? Why does God test us? And we're not all like Abraham. We're not all going to receive uh, the blessing that uh, God gives to Abraham here. Although we are beneficiaries of the blessing that Abraham received because that seed in which all the nations are blessed is Jesus. But Romans 5 verses 1 through 5 uh, gives us uh, part of the answer to why we're tested says, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. And not only that, but we also glory in tribulations, knowing that tribulation produces perseverance and perseverance character and character hope. Now hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out in our hearts by the Holy Spirit who has given to us. So we see that uh, trials, tribulations produce perseverance, which produces character, which produces hope. Whereas my grandpa Heinig used to say, it'll put hair on your chest. Whenever there was anything that I didn't want to do, something I didn't want to try, he's, like tomato juice, for example. He told me to drink tomato juice. It was good for me, and I couldn't stand tomato juice. But he told me it would put hair on my chest. And I tried it one time, and I have one hair on my chest. That's it. <laughs> but the trials that we go through do make us stronger. You know, there's that old saying, if it doesn't kill you, it'll make you stronger. But when we go through trials, we learn how to persevere and it produces character in us. And you can look at the, the faces of people that have been through some, some serious stuff. You see the, the deep lines, the, the scars, and you can just see the character in their faces from the life that they've had, from the trials that they've gone through. And then every time we make it past a trial, that gives us hope. It gives us confidence that we just made it through something tough. And that gives us hope for the next trial that we face. We know that we've been through tough things before and we can make it through tough things again. And Paul, who was writing Romans, he experienced a lot of trials and tribulations in his life. You know, he was beaten many times. He was imprisoned many times. Uh, he faced things that we couldn't even imagine facing. And it produced character in him. And we see that in his writings. You see how many of his letters appear in the Bible. And those are because he went through trials and tribulations and came out stronger for it. Uh, Peter is another person who went through trials. And uh, so let's look at 1 Peter 1, 3 through 9. It says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, 
who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen, you love, Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. So we learn from Peter that trials test the genuineness of our faith. Anyone can say, I believe, I have faith, but testing is what proves it. Now, Peter was tested multiple times. Uh, One famous incident is when he walked on water. You know, G- Jesus was walking across the water, and uh, Peter kind of gave Jesus a little test. It said, if that's really you, command me to come out on the water. So Jesus did, and Peter stepped out on the water, and he began to walk on the water. And then he started to, to look around and get scared, and Jesus had to catch him. So I'd probably give him a, maybe a 60 or 70 percent on that test. And he had the faith to step out on the water, but then he didn't have the faith to continue to walk on the water. And another time, he completely failed the test. And that's when he denied knowing Jesus. And Jesus told him that before the cock crowed three times, he would deny him. And before the cock crowed, he would deny him three times. And Peter assured Jesus, no, I would never do that. I would never deny you. And then it happened. He denied Jesus three times before the cock crowed. Now, the great thing about Peter's story that is similar to our story is that Peter was given another chance to take the test. In John 21, verses 15 through 19, it's after Jesus' resurrection, and he's with the disciples. In verse 15, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, Do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. So, Peter says three times, once for every time that he denied God, he says, yes, Jesus, I love you. But notice that Jesus gives him something to do after each time. He says to to feed my lambs, to tend my sheep, and to feed my sheep. So it wasn't enough that Peter just said, yes, Lord, I love you. Yes, I love you. Peter was going to have to prove that he loved Jesus. He was given work to do. As we read in the book of Acts and we read the two letters that Peter wrote that are in the Bible, we see the ways that Peter did what Jesus asked him to do, the ways that he tended to the sheep, the way he fed the lambs and fed the sheep. So Peter put some action behind those words. He said, yes, I love you. But then he went and demonstrated his love for Jesus. And one more thing about Abraham being willing to offer up Isaac that makes it such a well-known passage is the parallel to God the Father offering his only begotten son as a sacrifice. Now, Hebrews 11, verses 17 through 19 says, By faith Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, In Isaac your seed shall be called concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. 
So Abraham believed that God would raise Isaac from the dead, and he proved that he believed it by being willing to sacrifice him. Now, as Christians, we say that we believe God can raise people from the, from the dead, and we say that we believe Jesus rose from the grave, but how do we prove it? Do we even have to prove it? Well, I've heard many people say that we don't get into heaven based on our, our test scores. We get into heaven based on Jesus' test scores. And that's true in the sense that we don't earn salvation. It is a gift. There is not an entrance exam that we all have to take where we have to score a certain uh, percentage to get in. Uh, Works don't save us, but we still have work to do. In ninth grade, I took American government, and my teacher was an elderly German woman, and she had a kind of a thick accent, and she was a feisty woman, but she wasn't the most observant woman. Uh, She gave us homework to do, but she never checked our answers. We would go over the answers in class. She just wanted us to do the homework. So in the morning after we had a homework assignment, we would just take our papers up to her, show her that we had done something, and she would check us off and check us off in her grade book that we had done the homework. Well, I was a good student, so I always did my homework, but there were several students around me that never did their homework And they got the idea of taking my homework up there and erasing my name and putting their name on it. And, you know, so she would uh, look at the paper, see their name on it, and check them off. So there were a few mornings where about five students would take my homework off. Like they would bring it back, erase the name, put the next name on there, and take it up. And they got away with it. And I did the work, but they got credit for it. Now, that system may have worked with Mrs. Hauser, but it doesn't work with God. We can't skip a test and expect Jesus to take it for us, to cover for us. Uh, And yes, we can fail many a test and still get into heaven, but the way that Jesus helps us is by showing us what we did wrong and telling us what we need to do to correct our mistakes. The Holy Spirit convicts us, we repent, and then we do better. We change our behavior. Now, my three-year-old daughter, Katie, is very quick to say, I'm sorry. You know, as soon as she does something wrong and she knows that we're upset about it, she'll instantly say, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And we keep trying to explain to her that if you're sorry, you'll change your behavior. You know, just saying I'm sorry doesn't mean that you're truly sorry. We need to see a change in behavior to show that you're truly sorry. And it's the same thing with God. We can tell God we're sorry, but then we need to show God we're sorry by changing our behavior. And have you ever wondered why you keep getting tested on something? Well, maybe you haven't passed the test yet. And we should be thankful that God has given us another chance to take the test. So the level of stress associated with the test is usually proportional to the importance of the test and how well prepared you are for it. You know, if, if you're taking a test that, where your career hangs in the balance, where your future hangs in the balance, where your life hangs in the balance, there's going to be a lot of stress there. But if you're well prepared for it, if you studied, if you know the material, you won't be as stressed as if you didn't know the, the material. But do we need to be stressed about the tests that come from God? Well, I imagine that Abraham was stressed going into that situation with Isaac. And I imagine Peter and Paul also experienced stress in their lives with the trials that they went through. And a certain amount of stress is a good thing. Uh, Military basic training creates stressful situations so that recruits can fail, learn, and grow stronger in a safe environment. Grace and I, would we have two kids that are out of the house now and we tried to give them enough leash while they were still home so that they could make mistakes and learn in the safety of our home instead of getting out on their own and then making even bigger mistakes. And that didn't always uh, work out too well for us. Uh, but you know, tests uh, do give us the opportunity to learn and to grow. And uh, soldiers, Uh, need to be trained 
so that when they get into a war, when they're experiencing the real thing, they're ready for it. So one day we will all experience the real thing, and that will be Judgment Day. And we'll be held accountable for everything that we've done, and it'll be pass-fail. And the question will be, did you truly believe? Did I demonstrate faith like Abraham, like Peter, and like Paul, or did I just try to hand in someone else's homework? And we don't want to get up there on Judgment Day. We don't want to be standing before the creator of the universe and, you know, not have an answer for him, not have not done our homework, have tried to get by on other people's coattails. Because there are certain situations in life where you might be able to fake it, but you'll never be able to fake it with God. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for the tests that you uh, give us. The scripture says the glory in the tribulations, the trials that come our way. Father, these are opportunities to rely on your strength and to learn from you and to grow. So, Father, as we experience these challenges, trials in our lives, I pray that we will learn from them. I pray that uh, with your help, we will overcome them so that when we do come face to face with you someday, that you'll be able to say, well done, good and faithful servant. In Jesus' name, amen.